Welcome everyone. Uh, so glad that you could join us today to the first virtual town hall on the impacts of COVID on legal aid and access to justice. As you probably know, the webinar is pending approval for 1.5 CLE credits, including 0.5 ethics credit, the information that everyone wants to know. For those of you who are WSBA members, the WSBA CLE will report your credit hours within 30 days of the seminar. Your webcast login serves as your sign-in. Questions, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A little button. If you have a question, please do it in that window. Uh, and if it's for a specific panelist, please write that person's first or last name with your question so we know who it's for. We have almost 600 folks registered today, so we ask for your patience. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can in this format. We'll try to answer questions live when we can, or we will respond back to you in the Q&A. And please don't use the chat box, please use the Q&A for your questions if you can. If you're on the phone, uh, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. If you wanna lower your hand, press star nine again. We're recording this, and the recording of this session will be made available upon request. And let's jump right into it and get started. We're so happy to welcome Justice Raquel Montoya Lewis as our first panelist. Justice Montoya Lewis was appointed to the Supreme Court in 2019 and has served as a Whatcom County Superior Court Judge and Chief Judge for the Lummi Nation, the Nooksack Indian Tribe, and the Upper Skagit Indian Tribe. In addition, to teaching at Fair Haven College. Justice Montoya Lewis, thank you so much. Thank you, I'm glad to be able to join everyone today. Um, I was asked to come on today to kind of kick us off and, and talk a little bit about what some of the issues are as we see them from the Supreme Court regarding uh, the impact of, of COVID-19, which is, is extraordinary on um, on our legal system and, and in particular, I wanna talk a little bit about what that means for us as, as a system as we move forward. One of the things that I think has been remarkable about what has happened over the last four, four and a half months uh, has been the, um, the development of new ways for people to access the, the courtrooms uh, that, where they need to go in order to get uh, things done. And so obviously many courthouses, uh, if not all of them are in some form of shutdown and continue to be today by, by the Supreme Court's order, uh, as well as by local directives from public health. But as all of you are aware, there are things that have to continue um, and uh, there's a variety of those things from emergency protection order hearings uh, to arraignments in criminal cases, um, to things like therapeutic drug courts, mental health courts, veterans courts, uh, drug courts, juvenile offender courts, uh, and things like that. And so this, as uh, each court thought about that, they, they were encouraged to come up with alternative ways for people to appear. And what has, has uh, impressed me with respect to that is, is that we have found alternative ways to appear and, and think about those things. And what that has made me reflect on is how creative it is, it is possible for us to be um, as a legal community in terms of increasing access to the courthouse. When I was a superior court judge, it, it was clear to me that, that many of the people who had court hearings, particularly on criminal calendars, but certainly beyond that, really struggled for a variety of reasons to get to court and appear uh, on their scheduled court dates. In Whatcom County, uh, we have a, a largely rural community. There's public transportation, but it's quite limited. So people that were living in the out, outlying areas, if they needed to get to court at 8.30 in the morning, often it was impossible or very difficult. They'd have to catch the bus at 5.30 in the morning in order to make it. And uh, they often missed it. And as a result of that, there were default judgments entered, there were bench warrants issued, other things that had very significant impacts on uh, the people that um, 
that were unable to get to court. Certainly there were a percentage of people who just chose not to come for whatever reason. But many of those people uh, that I saw who came into my courtroom seeking to quash warrants uh, or have default judgments lifted um, and, and other things along those lines um, often had reasons related to, uh, to access that were related to poverty, that were uh, related to uh, the, the, the realistic fear of losing employment if they didn't go to work uh, in order to come to court. Uh, and, and the variety of things that I know many of you are, are familiar with that get in the way of people appearing in court. And I really tried to work with, um, with our, our information technology people, with um, my colleagues, to think about whether there were ways that we could uh, accommodate people's appearances and not end up result, uh, issuing warrants and other things that would have negative consequences that were really directly related to, uh, to access to justice issues. And for the most part, I was, I was sort of told no, um, and it wasn't possible to do that, that we didn't have the, technolo the technology in order to facilitate it, that the rules didn't allow us to do that. Um, there were just a number of barriers uh, that were cited as reasons why it wasn't something that was reasonable or, or possible to do. So I was really pleasantly surprised when, um, that those things seemed to evaporate when the need became crucial and critical. Uh, and we were uh, in a position where people needed to appear in court in some form or fashion, and uh, it wasn't possible to do it because the courthouses were closed. Uh, a few weeks ago, maybe six weeks ago, I made a guest appearance at um, an adult therapeutic drug court um, in Whatcom County, which I used to preside over, and I was able to attend just to check in and say hello to the people that were in my drug court before I went on to the Supreme Court. The judge invited me to come in and, and say hi to folks, and it was, it was pretty amazing to see that there were ab about 40 people who were active participants in drug court able to appear in front of the court in a system similar to this. It wasn't Zoom, but it was something like it. And uh, and, and it was it was remarkably functional. There were, of course, technological challenges, but it, it was very functional uh, overall. And so, what I what that has made me hope is that as we move forward from this, as courthouses begin to open, uh, as we are in in a position to resume something like normal services, that we continue to bring the lessons of the last several months, uh, and it may be several months into the future that we continue to learn these lessons with us. Um, and, and it is my hope that people will be uh, willing, judges will be willing to accept telephonic and video-based appearances um, for people and rather than requiring their physical presence in the courtroom when that physical presence is not possible, feasible, or sometimes reasonable. I, I have had a number of calendars where I've issued multiple bench warrants for failures to appear when the appearance would actually maybe take less than two minutes in front of the court. Um, and it, it does seem to me to be unjust and unreasonable to have the expectation that someone is going to be on public transportation for four hours to make a two minute appearance. So I'm, I I'm inspired by what we've seen with respect to that, those possibilities, and I'm hopeful about that, and I, and I hope we can continue to do that. That said, as many people have pointed out, uh, there is an extraordinary backlog of cases, whether those are trials, and I've heard from many uh, lawyers on the civil side who are very concerned and reasonably so that they won't get trial dates in, uh, for a year or two years out now because uh, of the backlog of criminal trials that need to proceed to trial. And uh, I, I think that's a very reasonable concern, uh, how we get cases to trial when we have a limited number of judges, an extraordinary backlog, and the challenges of running a trial in the current um, public health environment where we need to ensure that there is social distancing um, that's happening in the courtroom. In, the, in my old courtroom, for example, there would be no way to get a, a, a regular sized panel of jurors to come in for voir dire and have them be socially distanced. It would, it would be completely impossible to do that. 
and also keep the courtroom open. Uh, for, there just would be no room uh, to accommodate the, all of that. So I think that there are uh, uh, some really uh, significant challenges related to how we proceed and move forward with trials. Um, and then I also think the issues in terms of um, the, the, the domestic calendars related to dissolutions, child custody, child welfare, child support, um, are also going to continue to be very challenging as those cases have been backlogged. Um, and uh, how we move forward on that is going to take, I think, a real um, collective effort uh, to, to think about how to do those things in creative ways. I certainly don't have the answers to that, um, but I am hopeful that um, we will be able to learn from each other as we each, uh, as each system figures out the ways that their particular court is going to do that. I'm aware in Pierce County, for example, that they have live streamed uh, bench trials. Um, I watched a couple of um, domestic relations related bench trial cases uh, occur. Everybody appeared by Zoom. Um, the trials occurred in real time on YouTube so that the courtroom was effectively open. And at the end of um, the trial, the, the, the YouTube um, link disappeared. It was not saved so that people couldn't come back and rewatch it. It was just something that was available during the live stream. It seemed to really work. And I think there are some ways where we can continue to do that uh, as we move forward. And, and I'm hopeful that that will at least begin to address some of the backlog issues. I think those backlog issues also apply to attorneys and trying to figure out how to manage caseloads when they've had cases um, added to their caseload, when they've not been able to move cases off their caseload. Um, but those are going to be enormous challenges. They're going to be funding challenges at a time when um, funding for legal services is probably going to be significantly hit by the various cuts that we're going to see across the board in terms of the, the economic situation we now find ourselves in. Uh, I, I, I worry about how all of those things are going to be resolved, and I really want to invite those who are participating in this as panelists as well as those who are watching um, this, this, uh, this um, presentation today to share with the Supreme Court what some of your ideas are, what you're seeing that works. Um, because I think one of the things that the, the roles that the Supreme Court can serve is, uh, is as an information distributor. I, I know that in uh, my, my position in Superior Court, very often um, I would be hearing things about what was happening in other courts a year after it had been happening. And uh, the distribution of that kind of information was hard to come by. I'd like us to be more active in terms of distribution of that kind of information because I think we're really going to need each other as we move forward. And um, I really look forward to your uh, participation in those conversations, to your ideas, and uh, I hope we can all work together to increase and ensure that we have ongoing access to justice. So I want to thank everybody for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak today, and I will turn it back over to Murph. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was inspiring. And it's a, an opportunity to think about or rethink the structure of our courts, given COVID and everything that's been happening around race, uh, racism. And one question we have is, given the backlog that you mentioned for the courts, is there a way to, prior to prioritize civil rights issues, whether related to a protester or the right to an education for folks who are being uh, homeschooled or don't have access to their education from their school district at home or special education or other kinds of important civil rights cases? Is that a possibility as the court returns to functioning or is it a possibility now? Well, I, I think everything's a possibility. That's, that's the way I look at, at things. And, and so I certainly hope that where there are things that need to be expedited, that they can be expedited. And prior to my coming onto the Supreme Court, there was a rule change that required the Supreme Court to expedite cases involving juveniles because time was so critical in terms of addressing those kinds of cases. So I do think that where there's a reasonable argument to be made that certain things should be expedited, 
over other kinds of cases, um, I, I think that that's something we should hear about and should be, and, and that should be something that we should take up either as, as a rulemaking body um, for our own court or for the trial courts. With respect to the specific questions related to uh, cases that may arise around protests um, and around uh, you know, other, other issues along those lines, um, I wanted to speak directly to the question with regard to education. One of the things that sort of took me by surprise when we started moving to, um, as a result of COVID, to an online learning environment was a set of assumptions that were, they were both assumptions and things that were stated openly about um, the online environment making everything equal, um, that people would have equal access, that kids would have equal access to education. I was stunned by that because I come from communities and tribal communities uh, that still don't have high-speed inter internet, that where there are homes that are um, uh, not able to access uh, any kind of, of internet from, um, from the locations where the kids might be. And in fact, um, it's certainly been my experience, both anecdotally and I think um, uh, more broadly, that the data shows that um, this environment only heightens uh, those inequalities that we saw in the classroom um, and those access issues. And so it, it's my view that those are emergent questions because this is not going away. It's not just going to impact next year's school year either because those kids have lost time in the last several months. Um, and so those kids that may already be behind as a result of um, the educational system, socioeconomic, concerns, racism, and other things are only going, that's just going to be exacerbated. And I think those are emergency questions that need to be resolved, whether that's in front of our court, whether that's resolved with the superintendent of education, uh, they are emergencies, and I think we should view them as such. Thank you. We have uh, two more questions. Another one is access as well, and this is around language access. So what are your thoughts around the use of interpreters for parties where everyone's appearing by video, uh, given the COVID distancing? And what does that particularly mean for clients who are either less sophisticated technologically or around the law? And what would it look like to ensure language access via video? Well, I, I've actually had a couple of conversations um, with trial court judges who have had hearings where interpreters were required uh, and I talked to one who had uh, three different parties who had a need for three different interpreters. And it was extraordinarily slow and very difficult to manage, both in terms of ensuring that the trial court was able to hear all of um, the, the testimony uh, from each of the parties, but also in terms of creating um, a clear record uh, that for the court reporter I spoke to one person who had a court reporter and another that was using the recording system, both of which were very difficult uh, in terms of preserving a clear record. I think that's going to present an extraordinary challenge for us, um, but I think that that can't mean that we throw up our hands and say we can't do it. Um, rather, I think that's something that the Interpreter Commission of the Supreme Court is, I know, thinking about and looking at. Um, but I, it, I, I do have. Um, you know, and anecdotal stories that say it's, it's very difficult to do, but we have to be committed to doing it and figuring out ways uh, to address that. Because again, that's an, another perfect example of the way in which the situation we're currently in is only going to exacerbate uh, those, those access issues if we don't take affirmative action to address it. We'll do one last question. There are several questions that have come in around video access and whether or not there's consensus around what might be the best uh, video system to use, and is there a best practices for using video for client attorney communication during a video trial, and will those be recorded so that the record is preserved? So I, I think, um, I, don't, I don't necessarily wanna endorse any specific technology. The, court, the Supreme Court has been using this technology, Zoom, that we're all on for oral arguments. Um, we have used that, I think, with, um, with a lot of success. Um, we've been able to ask questions. Uh, we're able to hear, for the most part, there have been some technological problems, but for the most part, it's worked relatively smoothly. 
but we have a dedicated informational information technology person who is extraordinary and uh, and he has worked with everyone to make sure that it's working and of course think about the people that he's working with we have um, the of course the nine justices and then uh, the attorneys who all have high-speed internet access and are able to access it there's going to be a, a significant problem however when uh, if we're talking about, for example, my, my thoughts about allowing people to appear um, through video conferencing for court hearings, uh, if they are in a part of the state where access um, to high-speed internet is limited, or they simply don't have access to a computer, which is going to be high numbers, how are we going to accommodate that? I think we have to be committed as a, as a court and as a system to, if we're going to go in that direction, to creating um, places, perhaps in libraries um, or other, other public uh, places where someone can access a system like that and have a private area. I have seen um, with, and I've talked to a couple of judges who've had uh, cases where they had testimony and then counsel needed to speak to their client and the client and the, and the attorney were in different, uh, different places. And so they used a breakout room so that and the, the judge said, okay, now we're going to take a recess and would then be able to put the attorney and the client in a breakout room so they could have confidential conversations. And then through the chat function, the attorney could say, okay, we're ready to come out of the breakout room and come back. I've heard that that has been successful, but again, it adds time and, and um, it, it, I think it's going to be a challenge for people to learn how to use smoothly. Thank you so much. That's the end of our time with the Supreme uh, Court Justice. Thank you again. If you had questions that didn't get answered, we will be sharing all of those questions with the panelists. So they will have an opportunity if they have time to answer your questions uh, in writing. Next up is Jorge Barron. Uh, Jorge is the longtime executive director at the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project. It's a statewide advocacy and legal aid organization working to secure justice for immigrants. And Jorge, I think, has some good news to share with us today. Thanks, Jorge. <laughs> thank you, Murph, and thank you. And I just want to say, uh, Justice Matoya Luis, thank you for uh, your comments. And uh, it's uh, great to serve under your leadership here as part of the Access uh, to Justice community. So thank you for the introduction, and thank you, Murph, for moderating. Um, so yes, hello everybody. Um, thank you for participating in the session. I'm going to try to go uh, uh, quickly and I'm going to try to actually share my screen here and see if the technology actually works so that I can do this, uh, this PowerPoint presentation. So I hope it will, it will work. Um, um, and as Murph mentioned, um, our role in the Alliance of uh, Northwest Immigrant Rights Project is to uh, provide immigration legal services uh, throughout the state of Washington. Um, and most of our services are focused on, on providing that representation uh, directly to uh, people on individual cases, but we also engage in impact litigation, uh, systemic advocacy, and community education. Um, and as Murph mentioned, we do have some great news. Uh, we we had um, been expecting this decision from the Supreme Court on the on the, the case uh, involving the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals case. Uh, for DACA, and I want to particularly give a shout out to uh, Shannon and the team at the Attorney General's office because uh, they were one of the entities that brought this challenge on behalf of the state of Washington. Um, um, and just as a quick recap for those of you who have not been tracking this, uh, this was uh, the, the the situation involved the, the DACA program, which is what uh, President Obama launched in 2012 uh, to protect people who had come to the United States at a young age and who have been living here for a long time and uh, were uh, at risk of deportation. And President Obama had created this program to uh, provide protection from deportation and, and, and allow them to have work permits. Uh, the Trump administration in 2017 had uh, moved to end the program and the legal challenges were brought um, and, um, and blocked that decision. And they all eventually ended up before the Supreme Court uh, where they were heard in November. Uh, and then uh, we have been anticipating for over the last several weeks uh, a decision from the court. And, 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 you know, we were, many of us were bracing for the possibility of a negative decision. And we were very pleased that today the court ruled uh, that the administration's attempt to uh, rescind uh, the DACA program uh, would, did not comply with the uh, Administrative Procedures Act um, and was unlawful. 
Um, and uh, now that doesn't mean that they can't try again. Um, and I just saw the latest uh, sort of DHS, uh, Department of Homeland Security sort of reaction to it. And it was pretty um, uh, negative and, um, and um, almost like angry. And so I am, we are preparing for the fact that there could be, you know, further attempts to try to undermine the program, but we're very pleased with today's ruling. Uh, it's not the end of the road. We still feel like Congress needs to uh, to, to act um, and um, and resolve, uh, you know, provide a permanent solution to uh, the situation for both the DACA recipients and other undocumented individuals. Uh, but it certainly uh, is a relief uh, that, that the imminent threat of the program ending uh, has been lifted from uh, over 16,000 DACA recipients currently in the state of Washington and over 600,000 across the country. So uh, it is a good day. We've been very pleased with uh, with the court's decision and. There's still, I will say, some questions that we're still trying to uh, analyze and figure out how the administration is going to respond to um, regarding uh, uh, other aspects of, of, of the program, uh, but definitely a very, uh, a very good day from, from our end on, uh, uh, because of the court's decision. Um, uh, so besides that, I actually, this was not what we were going to focus on, so I just want to talk very briefly about some other issues and some of the challenges, uh, specifically dealing with the uh, pandemic that um, our, the communities that our organization serves, immigrants and refugees here in the state of Washington, have been experiencing during COVID-19. Um, and there's a lot that I could tell you, but I, my time is short, so I'm just going to focus on a couple of things that I wanted to highlight and, and, and talk a little bit about the ways that we've been uh, trying to respond. Um, the the uh, one of the things that I wanted to emphasize is, you know, of course, you know, the pandemic has had a pr profound impact on, you know, communities across the state in many different ways. Uh, but I do want to flag that one of the things that has been concerning to us has been the very disproportionate impacts that the the health impacts, the direct sort of health impacts in terms of infections and um, illnesses um, uh, from the pandemic on uh, uh, communities of color and specifically on immigrant communities. And for those of you that have not been looking at the statistics, um, I'm just showing you here, this is the latest ones that were published yesterday by the Washington Department of Health in terms of the breakdown of uh, the infection rates uh, across um, uh, different ra racial and ethnic groups. And you'll notice there that um, of, of the ones that have um, identified uh, racial and ethnic breakdown, 43% of infections in the state of Washington have been in people who identify as members of the Latinx community um, and um, or as it's described here, the Hispanic community. And uh, even though that we only constitute 13% of the total state population. And so just a dramatic um, uh, disparate impact on, on that community. And while, of course, not all Latinx community members are immigrants, uh, there are other um, uh, uh, indications that uh, that it's particularly hitting immigrants. So um, I'm sharing here, this is some information that we received at uh, UW Medicine and folks at Harborview have done, where they studied at their um, uh, units uh, here in King County, um, the infection rates, and they did, a, they did an analysis based on the language that people uh, spoke as their primary language. Uh, and you can see the statistics there that when they compared, like when they when they when people were tested, how frequently uh, people tested positive. And this is kind of during the initial phase uh, of infection. So this is like in March and April. Um, and you see that people whose primary language uh, um, is is English were testing at a 7.7 percent rate, and then people who spoke another language were 25 percent. And in, in for some specific language groups like Spanish and and, and Amharic the rates were over a third. And so um, pretty strong indications that the, the actual health impacts are falling particularly heavily on uh, specific communities. And so part of uh, what we've been working with on in terms of some of the advocacy um, has, has related to the fact that uh, unfortunately, besides the sort of health impacts for the people who are, um, uh, who are undocumented and don't have full immigration status, um, the other challenge is the economic impact that, of course, this is having, and particularly the fact uh, that the, the, those communities do not have access to the safety net protections that many of uh, the rest of us can enjoy when there is a situation. And so, for example, uh, undocumented family members, uh, people who are undocumented, are not eligible for the stimulus checks that many of us uh, received. 
Um, and, and this is true, um, you know, for, for a family, even if only one of the parents, for example, is undocumented. So we see many situations where you might have an undocumented parent, uh, another parent who's a U.S. citizen, and then U.S. citizen children. And, uh, and because there's that one parent who's undocumented, if they're filing their taxes jointly, the entire family, both the U.S. citizen spouse and the children, all get denied this, the, or have been denied the stimulus checks. And so, um, so that's been a huge impact for people. And then on top of that, folks who are undocumented are not eligible for unemployment insurance uh, if they do lose their job. And so that's been another big barrier for people. Um, on top of that, many of you may, may have heard about this public charge rule that um, the administration has put in place, uh, which essentially um, has the effect of discouraging people from accessing help. And, and part of the challenge has been uh, the timing in some ways couldn't have been worse because the, the, after some legal challenges, the, 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 um, including by, by our state attorney general's office as well, uh, the, the rule was actually put into effect on February 24th, right, right before the pandemic really hit uh, 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 severely. And so um, we've heard from a lot of community members who are actually eligible for some of the protections, including things like unemployment insurance, that uh, they have uh, uh, decided to forego that help because they're concerned about what that might mean in terms of uh, the impact on their immigration status. So really, um, uh, you know, a bad, bad situation in terms of like the confluence of these things happening at the same time. And all of this is happening, of course, as, as, as immigrant workers are frequently on the front lines and uh, in doing uh, jobs uh, for those that, that have not lost their employment uh, where they are at higher risk. And we think that's, that's, that's a significant part of the reason that you see the numbers and the disparities that, that I showed you on the, on the chart. So we've been working on trying to address those issues uh, and, and the deep impact that that's having. Um, the other thing that I wanted to highlight has been our concern around the situation at the Northwest Detention Center, which as many of you know, is the regional uh, place where uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement uh, detains folks, uh, people who are facing deportation and, and undergoing deportation hearings here in our state. Um, and uh, we've been deeply concerned just because of like the evidence throughout the country of um, how the, the pandemic and the virus has impacted. And just to give you a sense of how that is, um, the the, the testing rate when ICE actually does, and, and there's been a lot of delays, if there's been delays at the state level, there's been even more delays in getting ICE to actually test people uh, throughout the country. Uh, but you can see here that when they have done testing at the national level, these are national figures of all ICE detention centers, uh, people have tested positive 57% of the time uh, as of, as of uh, uh, earlier this month. And so we have been deeply concerned because there's already been situations where people have died um, in, in, in other states where of having people uh, at the detention center uh, be infected. And we've been involved in a litigation to try to push uh, the administration and ICE to release people and protect them. Um, we have been moderately successful in that effort, I will say. We have had, had some releases, um, and we also uh, were able to get uh, the judge, Judge Robart, to issue uh, uh, basically a direct, uh, it wasn't quite an order, but basically uh, moved ICE to actually test everybody in the detention center. Uh, the, 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 the Somewhat of a relief was that, um, uh, uh, at least for the Northwest Detention Center, um, we've only seen a limited number of infections and they've been able to not have the outbreaks that we've seen in other places, but we continue to be concerned about that situation because um, in some ways, as some, some of our experts have testified, it's almost a, only a matter of time that, that this could happen, particularly given that they're transferring people in and out of, of, of some of these detention centers. So that we've been monitoring very closely. Um, and, you know, all of this is, of course, like a very, um, uh, things are moving very quickly. And so I just wanted to encourage folks to continue to visit our website, especially around the DACA decision, because we are uh, still uh, processing uh, what came out in literally less than five hours ago. So, um, so as things move forward in that, um, in that front, uh, we will be providing information to the community. Uh, there's, for example, a big question about whether people 
who have not had DACA before will be able to renew, to be able to apply for the first time for the program. And so there's a lot of questions still up in the air. And so we're encouraging people to continue to uh, uh, get updates and uh, look forward to that. So I'm gonna um, take a pause there. I'll leave you with, uh, with uh, our website. Um, Name and our um, one of our colleagues of the Washington Immigrant Solidarity Network that's also been very involved in some of the advocacy, and, and a close partner of ours. Uh, we serve on the steering committee for for Wyson, uh, the the Washington Immigrant Solidarity Network again, and um, and I'm going to pause and uh, turn it over to Murph to see if we're going to tackle a, a question or two. Thanks so much, Jorge. That was a uh, really deep information. One of the questions that has come up is given the trauma that folks that you work with uh, might experience, what can attorneys or legal professionals do to support folks who may have experienced that kind of trauma? Well, I mean, I, I think there's obviously, um, you know, we, when we deal with this a lot at an organization too, of trying to make sure that folks uh, are connected to um, uh, mental health care resources and, and the resources that do exist, uh, which, you know, I, I, I think for some community members, one of the challenges, as I mentioned, was, has been the public charge issue, for example. And so folks sometimes are reluctant to even seek that help. And so I think one of the things that we want people to share is um, to, uh, you know, please uh, make sure that people have good information about things like accessing healthcare, accessing mental health resources. Uh, mental health care resources will not affect uh, your immigration status, will not affect public charge issues. Uh, there are some good resources, and we've been working with the city of Seattle, for example, to create a chart so that people have good information about that. So I think there are ways that people can help dispel some of the myths so that people can get the support. You know, as lawyers, we're not always, you know, equipped necessarily to provide those, but I think we can help reassure people that they can access the resources without repercussions. And I think for a lot of people in, in the communities that we're serving, that's a big concern right now. So that's, that's one thing that I think we as people in the legal community can really help is to make sure that those folks know that they can access those resources without uh, repercussion because there's a lot of mis misunderstanding about that issue in the community right now. Hey, another question that came up related to the disproportionate numbers that you talked about, are they exacerbated by people working in close quarters, such as farm laborers? I, I think that's absolutely the case. And I think we've seen that across the country that, for example, and we've seen it even here in our state, right, in the in the plant in, in the Tri-Cities area, um, that uh, in Tyson's food plant there, where, you know, people are working in such close uh, conditions um, that it, it made the impact of the virus just even more intense. And so, yes, and I think that's something that I know CLS and others and many part of the people in the Alliance have been working on trying to make sure that the state is uh, uh, working on, on uh, strengthening protections for workers and that uh, folks, you know, uh, are protected because again, they're, they're, um, they're considered essential, but unfortunately, uh, from our perspective, they're not being treated as essential in the sense of making sure that their health is protected. So I think there's still a lot of work for that, but I think that's absolutely part of the part of the issue. And one last question, Jorge, is for the folks who are non-English speaking, come from non-English speaking communities, is there adequate translation and interpretation for public health information about COVID? And is that related to the disparate num disproportionate numbers that we are seeing? Um, you know, I think I think there's information that has been created. I think my concern, so I think that the resources are there. The big question that I have is how um, much it's getting to the people, right? And and I think has it been shared and is there there? I mean, I know for example, King County Public Health has done a, has done a pretty good job of creating materials, uh, but the challenge is always how does how do we make sure that it reaches folks in the communities. And so I think that's another way that I think we can do. And, and I think obviously, I think in, a, in, in certain settings, it's an obligation to say employers should have, because I think that's what we've seen in some situations that employers have not adequately informed their, their employees of, of, um, of protections. And so I think there's still more work to be done on that front for sure. Thank you so much, Jorge. Just really quickly, I know that there are some tech issues for folks on the phone who want to raise their hand. If you have a question, you can email justice, J-U-S-T-I-C-E, at legalfoundation, 
legalfoundation.org. So it's justice at legalfoundation.org if you're on the phone and have a question. Thanks so much, Jorge. That's really important information to have. I'm going to turn it over now and introduce uh, John Tierpak from the Unemployment Law Center. Uh, John is the uh, executive director there. That's a statewide nonprofit law office serving thousands of clients, and I know they are having thousands of cases right now, and our Department of Employment Security System has been overwrought and overrun, and John is going to give us more information about his work that he is doing to make sure that people have the resources that they need, even just for basic survival. Thank you, John. Uh, during usual times, the Unemployment Law Project advises and represents people with their hearings, and we have, a, we have staff and offices in both Spokane and in Seattle. And during normal times, people call us for either advice or help with an appeal, whether that be a hearing or, uh, or a petition for review of a hearing that, that they had lost. Uh, but since March, since mid-March, we've been getting thousands of calls, hundreds each week, and sometimes over 100 a day, of people who simply are not getting access to the system. Uh, the phone lines are down. People uh, have trouble applying online. Their applications are either unable to be completed or uh, they're given messages like it's pending, but there's no formal to, to, to denial of their benefit. So if they request the hearing, uh, they sometimes get a rejection letter saying you haven't, you know, it's not uh, ready for that stage yet. Um, people are calling who have requested hearings of cases where they've actually been formally denied people who have requested hearings in March and April and May are still not having hearings scheduled. And this is not the fault of the hearing office. The Office of Hearings uh, does a great job in uh, scheduling hearings, but the office, uh, but they are not getting those notices that, that hearings are requested. Uh, when people request hearings, it goes to Employment Security Department and people are waiting uh, over a month uh, to get a hearing and when you call the office of hearings they don't have it and when you try calling the 800 number at ESD they won't answer uh, or when they do they say it's in adjudication or something like that so we have some real uh, due process problems right now that impact um, most people Excuse me, John. Uh, folks are having folks are having trouble hearing you. Could you you move a little bit closer to your microphone? Okay. Thank you, John. Okay. So, um, so I will speak louder too. Um, so there are um, a lot of problems with basic due process. Hearing requests are not being sent to the hearing office. So um we are getting uh, as i said thousands of calls and uh it has particularly impacted uh people with language barriers right now the only way to apply for unemployment benefits is either online and then online applications are in the english and spanish and others who need an, an interpreter must call the 800 number and I would challenge anyone to call the 800 number and see if you can get through. When people get through, they are sometimes, um, sometimes they can make an application. Sometimes they're shifted to other numbers or given other numbers and it's tier one and tier two and tier three. Um, so people sometimes wait on the phone. They call hundreds of times. They finally get through. They went on the phone for hours and then are often hung up on. Uh, I have talked to many people, and I've heard from other advocates in labor and in the in the immigrant rights community who say that when a person gets through and they're not speaking English, they are hung up on. They are not given proper interpretation. This is a serious issue. And when I uh, reached out to employment security leadership, in mid-April, uh, to request some uh, maybe 
assistance or to address the issue, the response was basically a form letter saying that everyone has to wait in line and to get back in, in line and call the 800 number. And I found that response particularly offensive because it reminded me of all the right wing people who've called equal rights special rights, you know, that, uh, that somehow uh, your group of people, your class of people is being asked to get some special treatment above and beyond what others are getting. And I find that particularly horrific in light of the fact that a significant number of our workforce are legal immigrants who are working, who have English as a second language and can't navigate these barriers. And to be told to get back in line when they don't have high-speed internet at home, they don't have the access that a, a middle class person with access uh, to an application would have. Uh, I find it particularly uh, offensive and there have been no, um, there has been real no movement on that. There was a uh, an announcement of a language initiative, but basically I haven't seen any real change uh, on that issue. So language uh, has been a real issue and we've been working hard on that. On the issue of class, um, the barriers of class, uh, you know, it's not just language. Um, people uh, don't have access to internet, uh, and, and this affects people uh, who are low-income people of color in urban areas like Tacoma, Spokane, and Seattle, but it affects rural people. Low income rural people have terrible internet uh, access and abilities, and also telephone, terrible cell phone connections as well. So to have to use internet as a primary way to to apply for for benefits is really um, it basically creates a definite class structure. And also, if you have to call a hundred times and wait online for hours, uh, you know, with your cell phone being poor as it is, uh, how is that even uh, possible? So these are, are barriers that must be overcome. And I'd like to talk about disability as an issue too. Uh, most people think immediately of physical barriers, but it's not just people who have hearing loss or visual impairments or, or disabilities of that nature. Thousands of the working population in Washington State who are applying for unemployment benefits have other physical disabilities, mental uh, uh, health issues that make coping with these systems very stressful. And the level of an anxiety that we have heard from people, what they're dealing with, uh, people who have post-traumatic stress, people with, who are bipolar, people who uh, have Issues already that, that make life coping with life more, more difficult are being t t t t put on hold. They can't get through on the 800 number. They're given cryptic messages about why they are not getting benefits. So uh, we have a system right now that is not not working. And so what we've um, uh, we are representing people who have hearings, giving people. Uh, uh, representation uh, when we can and we have a lot of volunteer attorneys right now and law students working with us um, we have also we have a volunteer attorney training coming up next week by the way if people want to get involved but the big issue is the, the state just processing these claims they have had months to do it and it's simply a mathematical issue. Uh, they, they simply did not hire the staff that was needed. They relied too much on websites and computers to make it happen. Uh, and my view is that it's, it is a simple um, issue of math, that if you go from a, a 4% or 3% unemployment rate and you have a certain amount of staffing, if you go to a 15 or 20 or 25% unemployment rate, you must staff up appropriately, and they have not done that. 
Um, so we are also uh, encouraging people since the Employment Security Department has not been responsive uh, to individual requests for help, um, to contact their state senator, their state representatives, and the governor's office. Uh, we have heard that some of our state senators and representatives have been uh, able to have people on their staff make contacts to help people get their claims uh, processed. Um, so it's been a tough time for everybody. We are answering hundreds of calls. And if you do call our office, it may take a few days for us to call you back, but each call is being returned. Thank you so much, John. Really appreciate it. I know that there has just been an incredible overwhelm of calls. A uh, question that came in uh, during the registration was, how is racial justice and issues of race equity, how does that impact the ability to get unemployment benefits or to access those benefits? Well, um, talk to an African immigrant who, who speaks English as a second language, whether it be Amharic or Somali. Um, you know, low income people, it's, it's clear that there's been a digital divide now forever among communities of color. So again, who has high speed internet? It tends to be people who are either upper middle class or upper class and who, who tend to be white. I mean, this is, this is pretty clear and obvious. And, and yet the Department of Employment Security in their effort to treat everyone equally is treating uh, people of color like second class citizens and and I, and I find it very offensive and uh, we have been advocating for them to staff up and process people's claims and to provide adequate access be it through language or through technology access and that is simply not being done. John, what are the lessons that the Unemployment Law Project has learned from COVID-19, whether it's moving digitally or access or some of the other lessons you have learned? Well, I, I feel bad that I actually believed employment security back in March and April when they promised that they would rise to the challenge. So the, the lesson learned is not to trust a large government agency who is more concerned about uh, public relations than about serving people. Thanks, John. I really appreciate uh, all that you do. And if you want to volunteer, please uh, contact uh, the Unemployment Law Project. And they have a training coming up, as John said. Next up is Elizabeth Fitzgerald. She's the Executive Director at Clark County Volunteer Lawyers Program. It's a nonprofit organization whose mission is to facilitate access to civil, civil legal aid through using volunteer attorneys. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Mert. Um, so I know we all have a lot of content to get through um, and a limited amount of time. So I'm gonna try to get through my stuff pretty quickly um, and then you know, leave as much opportunity to answer questions as possible. So uh, as Mert said, I'm one of the directors director of one of the 16 volunteer lawyer programs across the state. Um, so many folks uh, in, may be familiar that there's a volunteer lawyer program in their own community, but not necessarily aware that uh, similar programs exist across the state. Um, so there are 16, um, we're of varying sizes, though we tend to be pretty scrappy and uh, have a small staff, mostly of administrative non-attorney folks. Um, and the way we deliver services is by utilizing attorneys from the private bar to volunteer their time to give advice to folks who are low income with civil legal matters. Often it's going to be guided pro se work or self represented um, just because asking private attorneys all to take on full cases for full rep. Uh, is not as is not as possible. So that that's what our model looks like um, and definitely. Uh, aside from family law, which is always uh, the biggest, largest hurdle uh, for low-income folks in the civil legal world, uh, housing and eviction defense needs um, are, are chief among the concerns that uh, clients have at volunteer lawyer programs. So I just wanted to address, um, we've been in a moratorium for three months 
um, in the state of Washington, which has prevented uh, most evictions, though of course we're still seeing them for a variety of reasons. Um, but last year, across all volunteer lawyer programs, about uh, 6,500 folks um, were helped with housing issues, and that's landlord tenant um, specifically. Um, and another stat that I just wanted to share is the Clear Hotline, which is a hotline for the entire state of Washington, for folks to call in with a civil legal need if they're low income. Um, at this point last year, had about a little over 1,200 calls for housing concerns. Um, and they're right on track this year, despite there having been um, a, a mostly, uh, you know, a pretty wide speed moratorium on evictions for the past three months. So we know that clients are still concerned about their housing, the, about their inability to pay rent. They're still facing landlords who are um, trying to remove them from their housing, um, finding ways to remove them from their housing. Um, and we also know that this is a concern among clients because Washington law help has shown um, that we've had about a five-fold increase in uh, searches for eviction-related content um, as opposed to this time last year. So under normal circumstances, um, the volunteer lawyer programs, uh, of the 16, uh, there are 11 housing justice projects. These are usually courthouse-based programs. Um, so if anybody's ever been to an eviction docket and your community has a housing justice project, uh, usually there's volunteer attorneys there present to uh, advise and usually represent tenants at the docket. Um, and depending on the size of the program and its capacity and the number of attorneys that they can get to volunteer, uh, these programs will try to give advice before the docket, get in for a clinic model or appointments. Uh, but pre-pandemic, normal circumstances looked like advising on a lot of evictions for non-payment, um, for no cause, um, which is also called no fault. And depending on uh, the region of the state, the rules around that are different. Um, we, of course, uh, especially with people in poverty, have a lot of habitability concerns with uh, homes in poor repair, uh, without working utilities or hot water, et cetera. And definitely a lot of discrimination that's going on um, in housing. So uh, landlords, um, discriminating against tenants um, based on their perceived race or sexual orientation. Definitely with our undocumented population, uh, we know that uh, landlords are threatening to report ICE um, if a tenant pushes for a repair, et cetera. So that's something that has happened pre-pandemic with our housing justice project. So with COVID, uh, these programs that historically really operated on the ground and in the trenches uh, have had to go very remote. Most of our services are uh, occurring by Zoom or by phone. Um, it really depends on the technological capacity of either the program or the client. So we're trying to be as responsive to the tech ability of the clients as much as possible but um, preserving the safety and well-being of the staff at the volunteer lawyer programs. Uh, something that we anticipate is going to be huge uh, with the lifting of the moratorium are the um, onslaught of payment plan negotiations. So there's some protections that if somebody was unable to pay their rent uh, due to COVID during the moratorium, then their landlord must provide a reasonable repayment plan for their tenant. Um, what's reasonable should be up to the tenant. Uh, obviously, that's probably going to have a lot of negotiation happening. And uh, volunteer lawyer programs are, are definitely prepared to uh, educate tenants, the community, um, and negotiate with landlord attorneys on that. Um, we also are very well aware, as, as popped up in some of the questions earlier, that uh, there's a tech access in general, um, and then that's compounded when there's limited English proficiency. Um, so we're trying to find creative ways, and it, it really is is very community-led for how do we bring services to folks who don't have access to um, one or both of those, of those tools. Um, and finally, uh, whereas we used to be very docket heavy, we're very pre-docket heavy now, as much as we can avoid the process of, um, of having to everybody appear at the docket. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what we're doing. And we're working with the courts to find ways to have those dockets that are keeping people safe and also maintaining access. So depending on the community, some volunteer lawyer programs are working very closely with their courts um, to develop a, a Zoom-based uh, or a virtual hearing where their housing justice project is somehow involved in that. 
Um, some volunteer lawyer programs are working on, on making Zoom rooms in their uh, organization so that folks who don't have access in their home to Zoom uh, can go into the, the volunteer lawyer program and still participate in a virtual hearing. Um, and so finally, again, this is just a, a, a summary of the issues that we're both seeing currently um, and what we're expecting. Um, I will not read through all of them because I know this content will be shared as well. Um, but uh, solutions and how VLPs are responding. Um, one of the uh, really um, big boons to our program has been the Office of Civil Legal Aid was able to secure funding to expand uh, most of the housing justice projects. And so that's gonna look like many of the programs bringing on contract attorneys uh, to take care of, of eviction defense, um, staff to support that work. Um, and uh, we're also trying to increase um, the amount of landlord tenant mediation we can do on the front end. Any of that working together collaboratively is, is a big push of the VLPs right now. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That is great. Uh, I just wanna remind folks that we're not doing raised hands. If you have a question, please click on the Q&A button. If you're doing video or on the uh, phone to send the email. Elizabeth, one question is, what technology have you used during COVID and the epidemic, the COVID epidemic that was actually helpful to you that you might continue to use going forward? Yeah, so uh, I can speak for here in Clark County um, and also just in talking with other volunteer lawyer programs. I think many of us relied very heavily on, uh, we would serve somebody as long as they could appear in person in our office. So this has really forced us to use, uh, I think almost all of us are using some form of virtual service like Zoom or GoToMeeting, um, as well as phone consults. And we've actually realized that this has opened a lot of doors for folks who are homebound, who don't need to drive two hours to come get advice in the county where their case is. Um, and for attorneys who want to work out of their office and uh, they just have to call a client at a certain time, if they no show or don't answer, they're able to continue on with their work rather than be physically in an office and, and have to fill their time. So selfishly for volunteers, that's actually a very helpful thing as well. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I don't see any more questions in the Q&A at this point for you. Uh, if there are more questions, remember that Elizabeth can answer them in the Q&A in writing, so please continue to ask her your questions. Now I'm going to move on to consumer law and talk with uh, and hear from Shannon Smith. Uh, Shannon is with the, uh, uh, she's a senior assistant attorney with the Attorney General's Office at the Consumer Protection Division of Washington State. And she's gonna to talk to us about the consumer issues that have arisen uh, during COVID and what the AG's office is doing to address them. Thank you so much, Shannon. Thank you, Murph, and thank you for allowing me to be part of this program. It's really been outstanding and enlightening to hear this so far. Um, just to give a little bit of context to the remarks that I have today, it's really incredible what has happened even so far, just three months into the pandemic. The Bureau of Labor Stati Statistics has put um, uh, the, the U.S. unemployment rate at 14.7% for April and 15.4% in Washington. And there are predictions that that high rate of unemployment will linger um, in the double digits through 2001. There are 33.5 million Americans who have filed for unemployment as of April and nearly 600,000 in the state of Washington in April. There have been millions of private sector jobs that have been lost as a result of this pandemic and many of those jobs, job losses will be permanent. We've seen business closures and bankruptcies and uh, Amidst all that, we expect to see long-term repercussions um, for consumers as a result of the pandemic. Um, I would like to focus on just a couple of things um, in my time today. First, I'll focus on the immediate um, consumer protection impacts that we've seen in my office and what we're doing to respond to those. And then I will foresee, uh, I will talk about what we foresee as coming uh, with respect to consumer protection 
as we get into the um, uh, deeper into the fallout of the um, COVID uh, situation. So our consumer complaint volume has doubled since the beginning of the, of the pandemic. For each month in March, April, and May, uh, we saw double the number of consumer complaints than we had seen in prior years, and we're on pace to double that uh, number for the month of June as well. In response to the governor's moratorium on evictions, our, our office filed a lawsuit against RJK, JRK Residential and uh, recently resolved that with a consent decree. And that consent decree requires the company to make payments uh, to tenants or provide rent forgiveness uh, to those tenants um, and make payments to them if they had received unfair, deceptive, or harassing communications about paying their rent or their inability to pay their rent. And uh, as we move forward, um, the governor has extended the eviction moratorium until August 1st. And tenants who are having issues with their landlord with respect to eviction, with respect to violating the eviction moratorium, can file a complaint with the attorney general's office. And we have a special complaint form on our website at ATG www.atg.wa.gov for those tenants to file complaints on our website. In the immediate um, aftermath of the COVID emergency, we saw um, a huge number of price gouging complaints. Since the beginning of March of this year through today, we've received over 1,200 complaints about price gouging. Um, the complaints involve products that are across the board, but most of the complaints involve products that you would expect to see in this kind of situation. Uh, for example, price gouging on personal protective equipment like masks and gloves, um, price gouging on disinfectant products, price gouging on paper products, including bath tissue. And um, we've also seen some price gouging complaints with respect to food items. So we are watching those complaints very carefully and um, you know, responding as, uh, as the situation requires. We've issued 21 cease and desist letters uh, to businesses or issuing uh, warnings to them with respect to their pricing practices. And we have visited, we have made nearly 400 visit visits to brick and mortar stores and have um, been on uh, dozens and dozens of online marketplaces um, to view their pricing practices. Um, so, you know, many of those complaints are about products that are priced too high. But um, another thing that we're seeing with the, the hoarding practices as a result of the COVID emergency is we are seeing uh, a lot of consumers visit stores and seeing empty shelves. And uh, then they are um, required to buy products that are generally higher priced, um, even in a normal situation, than what they are usually able to buy. So that also is um, creating a, a, a feeling that consumers uh, are, are um, faith, that, that consumers believe that, that they're seeing price gouging. We have seen a number of complaints about fake or unsubstantiated cures or treatment treatments for COVID-19. We filed a lawsuit last Friday against an individual who was offering a um, vaccine for $400 um, to consumers without having done the adequate testing for that vaccine. Um, we have filed uh, two letters demanding that individuals or entities who are making these claims um, stop making those claims or provide adequate substantiation for the claims that they're making. Um, we have seen uh, deceptive solicitations uh, to, soli to um, assist consumers in applying for um, CARES Act relief or other um, 
uh, COVID-related financial relief. Some of these um, solicitations have been um, phishing attempts, uh, individuals trying to, to get uh, consumers to provide their personal information. Other times we have seen uh, uh, attempts to solicit money uh, to get payment from consumers in order to assist them in applying for these benefits. And we've put information on our website um, as a consumer alert to warn consumers about these potential scams and to be vigilant when they see an email pop up or a text pop up offering to help them uh, apply for or obtain um, financial benefits or other assistance um, in the wake of the, of the COVID emergency. Uh, another initiative that my office worked on is uh, we had made some recommendations and provided some information to the governor's office, office with respect to the moratorium on garnishments for consumer debt. So those are some of the things that our office is doing in the short term um, with respect to the COVID situation. And for the longer term, um, we foresee uh, many other consumer impacts that you could imagine happening when the economy is in this kind of situation. Um, for example, with respect to mortgage servicing, um, we may see issues that arise given the number of borrowers who are in forbearance. Um, uh, there are an incredible number of, of uh, uh, consumers who are in, in forbearance at, at this point in time, and that could lead to um, uh, errors and difficulty on uh, the part of mortgage servicers to um, provide them with ac accurate information, um, handle all of the forbearances, and make sure that these borrowers understand the consequences of being in forbearance. Um, and there is a, a difference in this situation to the um, mortgage crisis in 2008. In 2008, we saw factors that indicated a lot of culpability on the part of mortgage lenders or servicers um, in the origination of loans. We saw lax federal oversight and um, rules that might restrict state uh, action in those areas. Um, so that's very different um, set of facts than the situation we have now. Um, but from the consumer's perspective, you know, if they're not able to get the mortgage uh, servicing assistance, if they're not able to get the right kind of information uh, to help them, the the sort of the causes and the factors um, comply with the law. We um, also expect to see um, some potential um, uh, predatory lending practices. Um, we often see those kinds of practices when consumers are experiencing unemployment, reduced wages, or other economic uncertainty. We'll see uh, lenders take advantage of consumers by offering loan products that are designed to appeal to cash-strapped borrowers like deferred interest loans, interest only loans, no income loans, or other products uh, that set borrowers up, borrowers up to default. Um, Thank you so much, Shannon. Uh, time, we need to, I need to jump in. If you wanted to okay. have one or two more things, I do have uh, one question that we could end on, which is, you talked a little bit about this, but what are, what, given the pending evictions that could happen related to foreclosures or related to rent becoming due, how is the AG's office preparing for this onslaught that folks are really concerned about? Well, we have been working uh, on this for months. We have additional attorney personnel um, uh, in our office, folks in all kinds of divisions who have volunteered to assist in this endeavor. And um, we are reviewing the complaints that come in against landlords for um, not complying with the moratorium. And we are working to make sure that they comply with the eviction moratorium. Thank you so much. This is really helpful information. Again, if you have specific questions, 
for Shannon, please uh, put that in the Q&A and we and folks are responding to those questions in writing and we'll try to follow up with you as best I can. I'm sorry that I had to uh, cut you off. This is incredibly helpful information. And uh, Shannon, again, is available on the Q&A. Next, we're gonna talk about how you all can get involved. There's been several uh, questions in the several questions in the chat and in the q a about how people who are students or are legal professionals or who are not attorneys can get involved and so next up two folks are going to uh, talk to us about how attorneys and other folks can uh, get involved we're going to hear from joanna boyson at davis wright tremaine she's their first pro bono counsel and she directs and oversees all aspects of the firm's nationwide pro bono program and Paige Hardy is an attorney and she's with the public service uh, division at the Washington State Bar and she promote, promotes pro bono and public service opportunities to increase access to justice. Uh, thank you both. Thanks so much Murph and thanks for having us today. It's been such an incredible opportunity to learn. So Paige and I will cover various parts of the pro bono rule um, how to get involved and what tools are available for you. But before jumping into the um, substantive portions of our presentation, uh, I just want to take a minute to remind everybody about the oath that we all took before we became lawyers. And even though it doesn't explicitly say the word pro bono, it urges us to consider the cause of the defenseless and oppressed primarily because there are so many vulnerable groups that have such a hard time getting access to justice uh, simply because they can't afford it. So in other words, they need pro bono help. Pro bono work is covered under RPC 6.1 and at its heart or at its core, it really recognizes that with the privilege to practice law, which is a tremendous privilege, comes a great responsibility to give back. And that justice is so strongly tied to representation. And yet, in the last civil legal needs study, um, it showed that 76% of low-income Washingtonians appear before a judge without an attorney. And the vast majority of people that make up that 76% are low-income families, people of color, domestic violence survivors, uh, people with various disabilities, um, homeless youth, and many other vulnerable individuals. And they do their best uh, in court, but it can be extremely intimidating and uh, frustrating and complex. And getting access to justice and an equitable result um, is very difficult to do. So how much pro bono are you supposed to be doing annually? Well, under the rule, you should aspire to do at least 30 hours uh, annually. And for those out in Washington who hit 50, you receive a special uh, commendation from the WSBA thanking you for your service. The ABA rule encourages attorneys to do at least 50 hours, but yesterday there was an article published that bemoaned the fact that such a small fraction of attorneys actually hit 50 hours a year. And that's really too bad because if you break it down into monthly hours, um, to hit 30, you'd only have to do two and a half hours a month. And to hit 50, it's four and a little bit uh, of hours per month. And so really, you know, we spend more time um, watching funny cat videos on YouTube and doing other things that aren't changing the lives of, of people who need it the most. So I guess I'm, I'm underscoring this because when we see the number 30, when we see the number 50, we think, oh my gosh, I just, I'm so busy. There's just no way I could ever hit that number. I would ask you to look at it as a, as a, on a monthly basis and see if that if there's a way for you to actually hit those numbers. And so there are times obviously that you can't do that. You have a year where you have a health issue or you um, something else comes up in your life that prevents you from participating in pro bono or even practicing law sometimes. And in those cases, what the rule asks you to do is to donate to civil legal aid programs so that there is no break in continuity of legal services. So now that we're more familiar with just the, the mechanics of RPC 6.1, let's turn to what pro bono is and what qualifies for it. So I wanna start with what it is not. 
Um, it's not free work, unpaid work, or discounted work for those who can afford to pay. So, for example, if an attorney provides free legal advice to a wealthy neighbor or writes off an unpaid bill uh, for a corporation, this does not qualify as pro bono under RBC 6.1. It's not, pro bono is not synonymous with just free. Um, examples of clients who traditionally do qualify under 6.1, um, and this is A because there's B, we don't have time to go into it, but, but that's income eligible nonprofits and, and organizations that help the homeless. But under A, it's um, a broad range of people who can't afford legal services, and it includes um, DV survivors, abused and neglected kids, asylum seekers, income eligible nonprofits, and other vulnerable individuals in marginalized communities. There are so many ways to get involved in pro bono, um, and if I had more time, I would love to do just this comprehensive overview of all the different ways that you can use your skills to give back to the community. Uh, but with the dual impact of COVID and then race equity and justice issues hitting at the same time, the need for pro bono lawyers to donate their time and talent to specific causes um, is really tremendous. And this is three of 100. So please don't think that this is some sort of comprehensive um, overview of, you know, the biggest needs. This is not. It's just ones that I felt like would cover a broader, broad, the broadest range of categories. So these are a few ways you can help. You can help a small business understand how to apply for a PPP loan under the CARES Act. You can help domestic violence survivors navigate the DBPO uh, system remotely. You can represent protesters in bail hearings. You can help draft policy that fights police brutality. Um, you can work on cases that strive to end mass incarceration. You can work on voting rights initiatives, and this could include field work and participation, participating in virtual call centers, uh, litigation and advocacy. You can do all of these things and so much more. Um, my co-presenter Paige will now tell you about the tools and resources that are available for you to find these kinds of uh, opportunities. Thanks, Joanna. Um, I'm just going to try to go through my information as quickly as possible, so I apologize if I speak quickly. But the first resource that I wanted to point folks to is the American Bar Association, the ABA, put together a disaster relief pro bono portal. And I have a, um, on the slide, there's a screenshot of the front page of that website. And you can go on there and you can search for nationwide opportunities. We're um, currently working with Washington State organizations to provide state specific opportunities. So I definitely encourage folks to check out that website in the next coming in the coming weeks to look for opportunities. Another place you can look at is on the WISBA website. We have a, a COVID-19 Resource Center. And if you click on opportunities to help, there's a list of pro bono and volunteer opportunities for um, attorneys and non-attorneys to get involved in doing pro bono and volunteer work as it relates to COVID-19. Um, Perfect. And so one thing you, you might hear a lot of us speaking about is QLSPs and what a qualified legal services provider is. It's a not-for-profit legal organization that serves low-income clients in Washington State. And um, there's a lot of benefits that come with uh, volunteering with a QLSP or a qualified legal services provider. And one of the great things is that there's currently um, 59 QLSPs in the state. Several of them you've heard from today. And so, you know, these are all really amazing organizations that can definitely use the volunteer assistance. Next slide, please. Perfect. Thank you. And so I wanted to talk to you about some of the benefits of volunteering with the QLSP that the Washington State Bar Association provides. Joanna mentioned the pro bono honor roll, and that's a really um, great way to showcase your commitment to volunteer work. If you complete 50 pro bono hours in a year, you can um, certify your hours when you do your annual certification, and you can be on the pro bono honor roll, which goes on the Washington Courts website, it goes on the WISPA website. You also get a commendation letter and a certificate um, saying that you've accomplished this great, amazing public benefit. Um, you have access to free WISBA public service CLEs, which are on-demand seminars on the WISBA CLE store. And then, sorry, I'll slow down. But I think probably the thing that people are most excited by is if you're volunteering with a QLSP, your pro bono time can count towards CLE credits. And so it's a one-for-one -one ratio. 
So you can, um, for every pro bono hour you do, you can receive one CLE credit. So between the public service on-demand CLEs and your volunteer time, you can get close, if not all, of your CLE credits through this, um, through your work and through your commitment to volunteerism. Next slide, please. Um, and so I just want to kind of end by talking about race equity really quickly. And I know we've received some comments that are talking about this. And so I wanted to really connect folks with resources. Um, and so I think one thing that I'll say is when we're providing legal services to low income client communities, I think it's critical that we're doing this work and um, ensuring that the services we provide are done through a lens of um, analyzing and examining the systems of oppression that are in place in the legal system as it presently exists. And so as advocates, not only do we need to make sure we're providing um, competent legal services, we have to really um, see how the legal system is disproportionately impacting communities of color, in particular black and indigenous communities, and seeing how the legal system has harmful ramifications for these communities. And so I think that I would welcome everyone um, as advocates to really consider developing and implementing anti-racist practices when we're doing our pro bono work. And so Just Leave Washington is an amazing organization and they put together a pro bono equity training guide as well as blog posts and webinars that really kind of help us understand the foundational concepts of equity, particularly race equity. And I think ultimately will allow for us to build equitable client relationships. I think during the times of the pandemic currently, um, given the aftermath of the murders of, of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, and several other black people who are being murdered by the police, I think it's important that we're talking about these issues and we're centering race equity in every part of the conversation that we're having. Um, thank you. I think I'll send it back to Mer. Uh, thank you both very much. It's helpful information. One question that has come up several times is how can students or people who are not attorneys get involved to help low income people with civil legal need issues? So there's several ways. There's many. Um, every legal clinic has an intake process in the voting rights space. You could do field work. You can do, you can help with, you know, education initiatives. There's, there's many, many ways to, you don't have to have a law degree to actually do that work. You can help with the administration of justice just by virtue of um, your ability to um, gather information and understand what the legal issues are just broadly, and then kind of tee those up for the attorneys who can then answer those questions. Paige, did you want to add to that? I think, um you know, remote legal clinics, there's a huge need for legal assistance that you don't need to be an attorney to get involved and do this client, um, working with clients directly and helping these legal clinics really be able to facilitate legal services to clients. So I think that there are a lot of opportunities out there um, to get connected. And I don't think you, um, anyone that's a non-attorney is a barrier to providing volunteer pro bono work. Thank you. And there's been a question about funding and whether awareness of all the issues that has been talked about today from consumer law to housing to unemployment and particularly to racial justice will this help ensure funding and support for civil legal aid going forward and pro bono services was that to our panel or to one of the other panelists to both uh to you joanna and Paige. oh well as, as far as funding is concerned, I mean, I think that the Office of Civil Legal Aid and various organizations, especially those that are in the race equity and justice space, um, tremendously need that to expand their mission and to do mission critical work. Um, in terms of like state funding or other funding models, um, I would turn to one of the large QLSBs and maybe the Legal Foundation of Washington to kind of tell us more about what's happening with that. But what I can tell you is if you are on this call and you want to support any of the organizations that have representation on this panel or otherwise QLSBs out there, the, the need is tremendous. And they are, or C3s, they do need you to, you know, community donations are important to participate in that process. 
I want to think we're at time. We're one minute over. That's not too bad considering all that we tried to cover today. I want to thank each and every panelist for taking the time to volunteer to uh, provide the information that you did. I want to thank all of the attendees for coming to this uh, town hall. This is an ongoing conversation. We had many questions that we couldn't get to, questions about racial justice, questions about the panelists. And for more information, please feel free to contact LFW. I also want to thank the sponsors of today's webinar, MCLE, Just Lead Washington, the Washington State Bar Association, the Alliance for Equal Justice, and the Access to Justice Board. So thanks everybody so much, and I hope that we can continue to have these conversations. Thank you.